everyone. Thanks for coming to my class on Eucharistic Magic and Theory and Practice. I've wanted to do this for a while now, um, and so I'm really glad that uh, I'm able to share this with you folks and to people listening on the web. Um, before we start, a couple of things. We have a donation box out front. Every dollar counts. We love, we love your donations. It helps us to continue to do things like this um, and pay the bills. Uh, we have a bathroom, probably the bathroom you want to use is out here in the foyer. You know, everything is where the bathroom is. Um, that's about all I have for sort of general upkeep and stuff. I'm going to dive right into this. Um, no, you don't have to walk the door, that's fine. There's probably going to be stragglers who come in, so hopefully they just find their way in quietly. <laughs> so here are the topics that I want to cover. I want to explore why Eucharistic magic? Why would you want to be interested in Eucharistic magic? What are the different reasons that you might be want to look at this? Um, then I want to look at what Eucharistic magic is. My discussion of Eucharistic magic is going to be restricted to Crowley's thoughts on it. So it's going to be largely looking at it within the context of uh, magic and theory and practice, and a couple other texts to help enlighten us on, on some of the theological stuff. There's going to be, we're just going to do a deep dive on, on Crowley, so that way you at least have that background on what his views on it are. We're going to look at how to do Eucharistic magic. This is going to be by far the, the largest portion of this. Um, one of the methods that I'm going to use to really illustrate this is to look at various Eucharistic magic rituals. The one that's going to loom the largest is the Gnostic Mass, particularly sections 6 through 8. We're going to do a pretty deep dive on those, on those sections. And I have a couple other rituals we can look at to help explore the issue. Um, but the idea is really to sort of extract, we want to extract the principles of Eucharistic magic, show how they relate to Thelamic spirituality broadly, and then look at how they are worked through the Mass. And then finally, some practical takeaways that hopefully if you guys want to explore Eucharistic magic on your own, you can use these ideas and uh, apply them. And hopefully there will be things in here, even if you are not specifically interested in doing Eucharistic magic, this touches on so many different areas of magic that if, you're, if, you're inter if you are a magician, you'll probably get at least something out of this. So that's, that's generally how I'm here. So, why do Eucharistic magic? Why have this class on, on Eucharistic magic? As it turns out, there are several reasons why you might be interested in this, whether you're a Thelemite, you're an OTO, or you're just a magician in general. Uh, the first reason has to do, if, if you're a Thelemite, how it is connected with the central spiritual aims of Thelema and the overall spiritual path that was created by Aleister Crowley. He tells us, by the way, most of these quotes are from Magic and Theory and Practice, specifically chapter 20, which has to do with the Eucharist. There are some other chapters I pick from. I have the page numbers for the wiser second edition down here. And then the second set of numbers is um, the number, the number, the page numbering in Crowley's first edition. So you should be able to find these. There's also an online version and I'm going to make this um, slideshow available as a PDF, so you can just search through it and copy and paste and look for stuff online. Uh, so he tells us, a Eucharist of some sort should be most assuredly consummated daily by every magician, and he should regard it as the main sustenance of his magical life. And when I first read that, I thought that was an incredibly hyperbolic state, but in the course of studying this, I've, I've come to appreciate why he says this. It is of more importance than any other magical ceremony because it is a complete circle. The whole of the force expended is completely reabsorbed, yet the virtue is that vast gain represented by the abyss between man and God. So, so one of the key features we're going to keep looking at in here is this idea of a complete circle. One of the reasons that Eucharistic magic is interesting is because Eucharistic magic ceremonies model the cosmological process as understood by Crowley. And as it turns out, doing workings that model the cosmological process is important because part of the theory in this system of attainment is that you get the microcosm to match the macrocosm. You want to create a similarity first. 
and then they and then they merge together. The magician becomes filled with God, fed upon God, intoxicated with God. Little by little, his body will become purified by the internal lustration of God. Day by day, his mortal frame, shedding its earthly elements, will become in very truth the temple of the Holy Ghost. Day by day, matter is replaced by spirit, the human by the divine. Ultimately, the change will be complete. God manifest in flesh will be his name, or her name. So, pretty, pretty important stuff. He's making some very bold claims here. Now, here's, here's probably the boldest claim of all. He says, this is the most important of all magical secrets that ever were, or are, or can be. To a magician thus renewed, the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel becomes an inevitable task. Every force of his nature, unhindered, tends to that aim and goal of whose nature neither man nor God may speak. For that it is infinitely beyond speech or thought or ecstasy or silence, Samadhi and Nibbana are but its shadows cast upon the universe. And that is a really bold claim because knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel is the central spiritual or initiatory mystery of Thelema, of the spiritual path that Crowley created. He considered it his life's mission to teach this to humanity, to bring them to the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. And, and so, so anything, anything that, that would make that inevitable is makes it of central importance to the lamb. Now as for exactly what this phrase knowledge and conversation means, we're going to explore that somewhat in here, because I think it's really necessary to understand that in order to understand this claim. But it's going to take a while to build up to a justification for this. Now personally, I'm not sure whether Crowley is right in this claim, but I want to make it as clear as possible to you at least why he thought that, and what I think the most plausible argument is for that in terms of his spirituality. Now, another reason you might be interested in Eucharistic magic is because even though we do not know what the ninth degree secret is, it is almost assuredly Eucharistic magic or involves Eucharistic magic or could be done as a Eucharistic magic ritual. And Crowley gives us plenty of hints of this. For example, he says, the highest form of the Eucharist is that in which the element consecrated is one. This sacrament is secret in every respect. It is reserved for the highest initiates and is synonymous with the accomplished work on the material plane. It is the medicine of metals, the stone of the wise, the potable gold, the elixir of light that is consumed therein. The highest sacrament, that of one element, is universal in its operation. According to the declared purpose of the work, so will the result be. It is a universal key of magic. And so these are from chapter 20 in Magic and Theory and Practice. In the Manifesto of the OTO, we read, OTO possesses the secret of the stone of the wise, of the elixir of immortality, and of the universal medicine. So clearly, he's using the same language here to talk about both of these things. This is going to become a little bit clearer in a moment. Um, one of the things that motivated this class was that about a year ago, I was having a discussion with someone, and they were claiming that, you know, OTO doesn't teach magic, no magic is taught in OTO. And I said, well, you know, clearly we teach Eucharistic magic. I said, the ninth degree secret is prob probably involves Eucharistic magic, and our central right, our public and private right, is the Gnostic Mass, which is a Eucharistic ritual. And this person replied, well, that's just one technique of magic. And I was like, is it? So I went and I looked it up in Magic and Theory and Practice, and here's what Crowley says about how to do Eucharistic magic. He says, of the method of consecrating the elements, it is only necessary to say that they should be treated as talismans. The circle and other furniture of the temple should receive the usual benefit of the banishings and consecrations. The oaths should be taken and the invocations made. When the divine force manifests in the elements, they should be solemnly consumed. So all that's, re so all that's involved in doing a work of Eucharistic magic is that you know how to banish, you know how to consecrate, you know how to take the magical oath, you know how to do magical invocation, and you know how to consecrate a talisman. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's almost everything. I mean, I guess you're leaving out, what, divination and evocation, but 
if you learn how to do Eucharistic magic, you're going to learn a lot of the techniques of how to do magic. You're going to get better at all of them. So that's another reason that you would want to work on this. It's also a tasty way to get good at magic. It involves eating and drinking. So in summary, why do Eucharistic magic? It's a complete cycle. It mirrors the entire cosmological process, which is good in terms of making microcosm match macrocosm. According to Crowley, it culminates in the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Virgin Angel, which is the central initiation in Philema. It's probably good practice for the ninth degree secret. If you plan on staying at OTO for any time, or you think you might get to the ninth degree, you can start working on this now, and maybe in 30 years. Gives you something to do before then. And uh, it'll make you good at all other kinds of magic. Fantastic. So what is it? Oh my gosh. Here we have a picture of, uh, the picture I used here is of uh, Catholic Eucharist. We don't have any nice pictures yet of our own Eucharistic, right? But um, that is an example of Eucharistic magic right there, which is in fact very similar to ours in our, in our central right. I think the best way to understand Eucharist is as transmutation. When Crowley defines Eucharistic magic, he says, one of the simplest and most complete of magic ceremonies is the Eucharist. It consists in taking common things, transmuting them into things divine, and consuming them. So I've emphasized the word transmuting. So Crowley has all these like emphases in the text of magic and theory and practice. I've stripped all of those out. So if you see something emphasized, it's it's made. So I think that's why the way it's not confusing. So far, it is a type of every magic ceremony for the reabsorption of the force is a kind of consumption. But it has a more restricted application as follows. Take a substance symbolic of the whole force of nature, make it God, and consume it. Now we're going to look at these all in detail. What I want to flag right now is this idea of transmutation. There are different kinds of magic. Sometimes we think of magic as taking some kind of you know, divine force or some kind of magical power from out here and you know, slapping it down onto some kind of sigil or object, right? So that's an external relation. That's not the language Crowley uses to talk about alchemy. Instead, he tends to talk about transmuting things and converting them. Corn and wine are equivalent to flesh and blood, but it is easier to convert live substances into the body and blood of God than to form, perform this miracle upon dead matter. So the idea is that you're taking matter and you're transforming it and you're, you're bringing it into some new form. It's not pulling in something from the outside. That's not, he doesn't think that's the best way to look at it. And so really what this does is it makes Eucharistic magic a type of alchemy. The Eucharist with which this chapter is properly preoccupied must be conceived as one case, as the critical case of the art of the alchemist. And you'll notice that chapter 20 of Magic and Theory and Practice is on the Eucharist and the art of alchemy. And he puts them both in there. And as it turns out, this whole issue of alchemy is a portal down into pretty much the heart of Thelemic spirituality. So what's the essence of alchemy, according to Crowley? Most readers will be already aware that the main objects of alchemy were the philosopher's stone, the medicine of metals, and various tinctures and elixirs, possessing diverse virtues. So again, we see this language of the philosopher's stone and the medicine of metals, which we saw when looking at the manifesto of OTO. In particular, those of healing disease, extending the span of life, increasing human abilities, perfecting the nature of man in every respect, conferring magical powers, and transmuting material substances especially metals, into more valuable forms. So in other words, it covers a lot of diverse subjects. Yet, beneath this diversity of alchemical texts, we may perceive an obscure identity. They all begin with a substance in nature which is described as existing almost everywhere and as universally esteemed of no value. The alchemist is in all cases to take this substance and subject it to a series of operations, by so doing, he obtains his product. This product, however named or described, is always a substance which represents the truth or perfection of the original first matter. 
and its qualities are invariably such as pertain to a living being, not to an inanimate mass. In a word, the alchemist is to take a dead thing, impure, valueless, and powerless, and transform it into a live thing, active, invaluable, and thaumaturgic. So it should be emphasized that this is Crowley's interpretation of what alchemy is. You're, you're bound to find many different interpretations of, of alchemy. I, for one, know very little about alchemy, so I'm focusing basically on what Crowley sees to be the essence or structure of it. And as it turns out, when you're reading Crowley, it helps a lot to understand the structure. If you can get a handle on the structure, the bombast and the other details tend to fall off, and it's much easier to comprehend. And with all due respect to him, he does write a lot. So again, this is what we're looking at in alchemy is the rev a process which reveals the truth which was implicit in the first matter, but which we could not see or experience at first. So it has to do with divine potential within matter. So here is my diagram representing the alchemical process greatly simplified. And I hope you like this diagram because you're going to see a lot of it tonight. <laughs> Drill this in the so we start with the first matter. It's colored black because the, the negrado phase is usually considered the first stage of the process of the first matter. And the idea is that there's a truth implicit inside of that matter. Now the truth is not, it's not as though if you took a rock and broke it open, you'd find like, a, oh my gosh, the sun is inside of there. It's not like those cool alchemical texts that you see where there's like a little man inside of a you know, piece of metal or something. Um, I know, it's so sad. It's the invisible and the visible, is how you would say it. And then you subject it to some process. We don't know what it is right now. And out comes the truth. It's explicit now in the final product. It was implicit before, now it's explicit. This is the general idea. But as it turns out, there's, there's a lot in here. And one of the interesting things that Crowley points out in this chapter is that Alchemy and initiation are isomorphic. They share the same structure. He says, the reader of this book will surely find in this a most striking analogy with what we have already said of the processes of magic. What, by our definition, is initiation? The first matter is a man, that is to say, a perishable parasite, bred of the Earth's crust, crawling irritably upon it for a span, and at last returning to the dirt whence he sprang. Crowley's thumbnail account of, of human existence without <laughs> divine illumination. No frills. No frills. The process of initiation consists in removing his impurities and finding in his true self an immortal intelligence to whom matter is no more than the means of manifestation. So another word for that is true will, right? The initiate is eternally individual. He is ineffable, incorruptible, immune from everything. He possesses infinite wisdom and infinite power in himself. So this is the initiation process, greatly simplified. You have a candidate. There is an immortal soul implicit in that candidate. I'm calling it soul just for, you know, just. There, there's no metaphysics of a soul necessarily implied here. I'm just using the word to kind of put a label to it. You bring it through a process, and now that divine part of the individual is made explicit to the candidate, to the initiate, and it can become an ordering principle of their life. So before, when they were subject to external pressures, they are now oriented toward this higher thing, and that dictates their relationship with, with the body and with sensation and emotion and the rest. That's the basic idea. Interestingly, in the same chapter, Crowley also shows that art production follows this same, this same structure, which is very interesting. Um, if you've heard any of my talks on um, artistic beauty and magic, I milk that one to death. 
There is an obvious condition which limits our proposed operations. This is that, as the formula of any work affects the extraction and visualization of the truth from any first matter or stone or elixir, which results from our labors, will be pure, the pure and perfect individual, originally inherent in the substance chosen and nothing else. So in other words, you can only bring out what was already there. The most skillful gardener cannot produce lilies for the wild roses. His roses will always be roses. However, he hath perfected the properties of this stock. Now, think of this in light of this line that we saw before. Take a substance symbolic of the whole course of nature, make it God, and consume it. That's my ghost factor of my mind. Um, as near as you can make that substance to being a universal substance, so will be the nature of the spirit that you pull out of it. This is going to become very important in a moment. According to the nature of the sacrament, so will its results be. And some one may receive a mystic grace culminating in samadhi. We're going to look later on at what samadhi means. And others, a simpler, more material benefit may be obtained. So for example, if you, if you chose a Eucharist which was particular to, which had um, Venusian qualities, Right. Let's say you were doing some kind of magical working with, with Venus. You could get perhaps get a particular effect of bringing more beauty or love into your life through doing that. Right. That would be what he would call the, the simpler or more material benefit. Whereas the more universal you make that substance, the more general will be the spirit. It's not going to have necessarily any particular qualities. And this becomes very important if you want the ability to bring about any state of affairs whatsoever, which is what he promises from the ninth degree Eucharist, which is the Eucharist of one element. Here we go. The Eucharist of one element is one substance and not two, not living and not dead, neither liquid nor solid, neither hot nor cold, neither male nor female. So it's completely ambivalent. The highest sacrament, that of one element, is universal in its operation. According to the declared purpose of the work, so will the result be. It is a universal key of all magic. So hopefully you can see kind of why he would be inclined to make that claim about it. If you could get that starting substance, which was ambivalent that way, then you could have an ambivalent spiritual substance that you could then turn into whatever you wanted to. That would be the idea. So in summary, Eucharistic magic consists in the transmutation of common things into divine things and the consummation or consuming of them. There's an ambiguity in those words, which we're going to look at later, which is very interesting. Because he uses both words to describe what comes at the end of a Eucharistic act. We've seen that it's a type of alchemy. It's a bringing forth of some truth or divinity latent within mere matter. We've seen that what we bring forth depends on what we start with. In other words, the potencies contained within the matter itself the more universal the first matter, the better it represents nature in toto. The more universal will be the final product. And we've seen that the most perfect form of this, the Eucharist of one element, is the medicine of metals, in which the one, or the holy guardian angel, or whatever you want to call it, is drawn out of matter. That's Crowley's. That would be the highest spiritual principle that you could get from, the, from doing this. This will be, I'll make this clear. This isn't clear right now, but you'll see why. So how do you do this? Um, here's basically the outline that Crowley gives for how to do it. You have what he calls the preparations of chastity, fasting, and aspiration. Then you have banishing and consecration of temple and instruments. Then you have the consecration of the Eucharist itself. Then you have the consummation of the Eucharist. So those are the steps we're going to look at. With regard to the preparations for such sacraments, the Catholic Church has maintained well enough the traditions of the true Gnostic Church in whose keeping the secrets are. Chastity is a condition. Fasting for some hours previous is a condition. And earnest and continual aspiration is a condition. So these are the steps that he recommends you go through before doing this particular kind of magic. So what does chastity mean? Probably not what you think. The word chastity is used by initiates to signify a certain state of soul and of mind determinant of a certain habit of body which is no wise identical with what is commonly understood. 
Chastity in the true magical sense of the word is inconceivable to those who are not wholly emancipated from the obsession of sex. So it has nothing to do with restraining yourself from sexual intercourse or sexual activity. So what does it mean? As it turns out, he has a little essay called Chastity and Little Essays Toward Truth. The innocence of the adept. To asking it like incredulously. The innocence of the adept? What? We are at once reminded of the strong innocence of Harpocrates and of his energy of silence. Harpocrates is going to be very, very important to this discussion, by the way. A chaste man is thus not merely one who avoids the contagion of impure thoughts and their results, but whose virility is competent to restore perfection to the world about him. So again, this idea of perfection, perfecting things. Thus the Parsifal, who flees from Kundri and her attendant flower witches, loses his way and must wander long years in the desert. He is not truly chaste until he is able to redeem her, an act which he performs by the reunion of the lance and the sound grail. So basically what he's saying here is that um, he's, he's making a commentary on, on asceticism. So in the context of Thelema, Thelema doesn't reject asceticism or embrace it. The, like, Thelema doesn't necessarily tell you what to do about anything, really. The idea is that you could use asceticism or withdrawal from sensation as a technique to achieve something. But then the idea is that what you're ultimately looking for is imperturbability with regard to external things. That's sort of the goal of this that he was talking about before. Chastity may thus be defined as the strict observance of the magical oath. That is, in the light of the law of the lema, absolute and perfected devotion to the holy guardian angel, an exclusive pursuit of the way of the true will. So you know the diagram before, the, the initiation diagram, you, you, it involves a, a making explicit of this truth which is inside the person, the divinity, and you orient yourself toward that. That's the orientation of, of your life, and that dictates everything else. That's what he means by, by chastity. He means orientation either toward your divine self or toward aspiring to the divine self and making that your, your focus. We're going to look shortly at what that means a little more concretely. Um, this is from uh, T. Polyphilus's essay, Conditions for Eucharistic Magic, which you can find online. Commenting on this, he says, Taken as a whole, the magical concept of chastity may be summarized by the opening of Psalm 119. Blessed are those who are whole in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. The chaste magici magician has integrity in the literal sense of wholeness. The magician's entire being is dedicated to the work, and this commitment is a dynamic walking of the way, not a static position of timid purity. The Lord is the personal genius or holy guardian angel of the magician, and his laws do what thou wilt. You know, a more, a more down to earth way of thinking of, uh, about this is that in Thelema, there's, there's no external standard of conduct for a person. What's really important, ultimately, is what is true for you and what you can live in accordance with. So the question then becomes, can you, can you speak in terms of what you think, and can you act in accordance with both of those things? Right. That's ultimately what this chastity or integrity comes down to. It's, it's an internal alignment. It's the ability to do what is right for you, what you know on a personal level is right, and to, to avoid, avoid doing things that you already know are stupid and that you told yourself you shouldn't do. Right. That's, That's really what it comes down to. to. So, so can you have, and then of course, life comes in and tries to knock you out of shape, right? And then the question is, can you maintain that internal alignment while you are being buffeted on all sides by temptations to not have that integrity, right? And your ability to withstand that external pressure is what you might call your, you know, the, the extent of your character, or the extent of your, your integrity. That's what that comes down to. That's a, that's a very thelemic way of, of looking at it. Fasting. Uh, this is again from T. Paul Pilots' essay. In my own practice, I have found that a fast of about four waking hours is optimal. Such a rule should be adjusted for the health and metabolism of the individual, through trial and experience. The fast should permit a full digestion of prior meals, so that the Eucharist is consumed on an empty stomach. A slight conscious hunger can be an asset in the execution of Eucharistic magic, 
but the fashion should not be taken to the point that weakness ensues or that a deficiency of blood sugar creates irritability or loss of concentration. Um, the way that I personally approach the issue of fasting is that it is a tool to create a sense of reverence around what you are about to do. That's how I look at it. That is why I would apply a fast in any magical working. I don't think necessarily that there is any particular other effect from it besides that, but it certainly puts me in a serious state of mind to do what I'm about to do. Um, but you're welcome to um, experiment with that as you will. Um, again, from Polyphilus, a mere pretense of enacting the ritual, whether to impress others, to provide for their instruction, or as a deliberate deception, will not suffice to effect consecration. Note also that for clergy to reduce Eucharistic ceremony to pretenses of violation of sacerdotal chastity, as defined above, you'll receive the citation now. <laughs> Continuity of aspiration is closely related to its earnestness. Continuous aspiration must be an inherent development of the ongoing spiritual condition of the magician. It cannot be a provisional or experimental attitude. It cannot be feigned or temporarily positive. Many questions in a Eucharistic ritual may be resolved on a provisional basis, but not the central aspiration of the mission. So are you earnestly trying to do the ritual? Are you really bringing your intention to it? Is your mind there? Are you, are you doing it seriously? Or are you just going through the motions or just you know, treating it like a stage performance? That's what that really comes down to. Uh, one of the things I noticed while going through this is that the three principles of chastity, fasting, and aspiration very closely match the principles that Crowley sees embodied in the Scourge, Dagger, and Chain. So this is from uh, Book 4, Part 2 on the Scourge, Dagger, and Chain chapter. It says, the Scourge keeps the aspiration keen. Obviously, that's aspiration. The Dagger expresses the determination to sacrifice all. So you're sacrificing the middle, that's fasting. And the Chain restricts any wandering. That's, that's the chastity. That's the one point to focus on, on the purpose. Um, after you use the scourge, dagger, and chain, he says to anoint yourself with holy oil. He says, the holy oil is the aspiration of the magician. It is that which consecrates him to the performance of the great work. It is also the grace or chrism, for this aspiration is not ambition. It is a quality bestowed from above. So that, that distinction is important. The scourge represents a desire from above. It's awakening the nefesh or the animal soul to, to do the ritual. This is the ambition of the divine to unite with human, which is an interesting idea. And we're going to look at that way at the end when we look at um, the end of the Gnostic Mass, because I think that's important. It is not the will of the magician, the desire of the lover to reach the higher, but it is that spark of the higher in the magician which wishes to unite the lower with itself. So here's how I've tied all of this together. So you have a four-sided pyramid, the, the pinnacle of which is this idea of dedication with the holy oil, which to my mind represents concentration and one point of focus on, on the goal. Because at the point where the divine breaks through, you have achieved concentration at that point. Supporting it, you have these three factors represented by the dagger, the chain, and the scourge. The dagger, and, and these apply not just to Eucharistic magic, not just to magic, but to meditation as well. These are very general factors for building concentration. People at times complain, they say, I just, I have really bad concentration. I can't do meditation because I have bad concentration. Well, you know, newsflash, nobody really has good concentration. Concentration isn't something you have. Concentration is something that arises when you have a basis for it, when you have these three factors. The first factor, well, starting at the bottom, is, is ardency. Are you awake enough? Are you bringing enough energy to the practice to be able to do it? Mindfulness, and that's, and that's related to aspiration, as we saw before. Mindfulness, why am I doing this ritual? What is this ritual aiming for? What is the purpose of it? If you have a strong sense of purpose infused throughout your ritual, it tends to pick everything else up with it. This is probably the most important factor in terms of building concentration, in my opinion. So for example, when you're performing the Gnostic Mass, you know, are you kind of zoning out or is your mind there? Are you mindful of what you're doing? Another way to think about mindfulness is really just, you know, like if you were cutting something with a chainsaw, right, like this, you would be really mindful of what you were doing, 
Because if you slipped with it, you would cut an artery and you would just you would die before the ambulance came. So you're paying a lot of attention to it. Like almost that level of perception and awareness is very helpful for doing meditation or for doing magic. And then the attentiveness is when your mind goes off, do you bring it back right away? Because your mind is going to go off. Do you notice it and just put it back? That's what that is. And if you get these three factors going, and if you get them in balance, they build on each other. And you can get strong concentration, and it takes off by itself. So if you can't concentrate, if you're having trouble, it helps to figure out which one is you're missing or is out of balance. This is a good one to focus on, the mindfulness. So that's, that's, maybe that's helpful for, for people in terms of building up your own concentration. Concentration is really the missing factor in everything, I find, in terms of uh, spirituality. If you have good concentration in doing like a, a public ritual, it looks good. If it doesn't look good, it's usually because concentration wasn't there. You don't need strong, dramatic performance. You just need good concentration and presence. And you can tell when people are present and when they're not. Now we move to the actual um, work of Eucharistic magic itself. We saw this passage before. It should be treated as a talisman. You're going to banish and consecrate the temple. You're going to take the magical oath. You're going to make the invocations, and then you consume the thing. That's, that's what's involved in it. We're not going to look at all of these in depth, because um, I want to get quickly to the actual Eucharist itself. So banishing. Um, Purity means singleness. God is one. So you can see how his understanding of banishing is very closely related to that issue of chastity and of mindfulness. He's going to keep coming back to that. If one littlest thought intrude upon the mind of the mystic, his concentration is absolutely destroyed. Well, yeah, that's true by definition. So banishing helps put you in a mind, helps build up your mindfulness, basically, in that, that level of purity. Consecration is the act of dedication of a thing to a single purpose. There it is again. The whole idea is the purpose. Just as a sidebar, I mean, one of the themes that we're going to keep coming back to is that if you want to understand a ritual, like for example, the Gnostic Mass, you should think about the purpose and you should think about the structure that's put in place to get to the purpose. That helps simplify a whole lot. And you can see he tended to think about it in a similar way. Uh, speaking of the Gnostic Mass, here's the purification and consecration of the priest from uh, section 3 of the Gnostic Mass. The priest takes water and salt. Let the salt of earth admonish the water to bear the virtue of the great sea. Mother be thou adored. She makes three crosses on him. Be the priest pure of body and soul. He's purified now. The three crosses are meaningful. We'll come back to that later. Then for the consecration, she does the same thing with incense. Be, be the priest fervent of body and soul. She also consecrates the lance 11 times up and down. Be the Lord present among us. So that's, that's ritual consecration from the Gnostic Mass. Um, T. Polyphilus has written a short Eucharistic ritual, which is structurally similar to the Gnostic Mass. It's worth looking at. Um, this is his purification and consecration of the magician. You stand in the sign of Aramoth, you say, for pure will on assuaged of purpose delivered from the lust of result is every way perfect. And then he visualized the chakras opening. Then in the sign of Tumashneeth, I am uplifted in thine heart, and the kisses of the stars rain hard upon thy body, and he visualized the serpent winding up the Shishuna. So it's a good visualization to get you get you focused. Uh, the magical oath. The magician strikes once upon the bell. He then declares who he is, reciting his magical history by the proclamation of the grades, which he has attained, giving the signs and words of those grades. He then states the purpose of the ceremony. Again, orientation toward purpose, toward outcome. He then takes an oath before the Lord of the universe, not before the particular Lord whom he is invoking. He swears solemnly that he will perform it. He strikes upon the bell. He admits himself to be a weak human being, humbly aspiring to something higher, a creature of circumstance, utterly dependent, even for the breath of life, upon a series of fortunate accidents. As it turns out, most of Crowley's like published rituals are not anywhere near this elaborate. Um, like Here's the roughly the equivalent from the Gnostic Mass. The priestess says to him, um, I say unto thee, arise, that thou may, mayest administer the virtues to the brethren. He comes out, gives three penal signs, that's showing his grade of man of earth. 
He says, I'm a man among men. How should I be worthy? And she says, like this. <laughs> so that's, that's functionally equivalent to it. He, he can see that he doesn't have, you know, not like ringing the bell every second. Oh my god, how am I going to do this? <laughs> just get up, man, just get up. Bring yourself up. This is from Polyphilus is short Eucharist. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. It is my will to consummate this Eucharist, that I may fortify my gross and subtle bodies thereby, that I may accomplish the great work. Love is the law, love is the law. There you go. Let you slip. It's a statement of purpose. And he says to consecrate the elements of the Eucharist as you would a talisman. He says the definition of a talisman is something upon which an act of will, that is, of magic, has been performed in order to fit it for a purpose. There it is again. Repeated acts of will in respect of any object consecrated without further ado. So if you make a new wand or whatever, you can do a whole elaborate ceremony to consecrate it, you know, under the moon or under the sun or whatever the hell you want to do with it. Or you could just start using it and just use it a lot and see if that works. Um, I tend to lean toward the latter myself. Um, this is how Polyphilus has you consecrate the bread and wine in his ritual. Take a cake of light and break it. You say, in the brown cakes of corn, we shall taste the food of the world and be strong. You make the ficus and trace, invoking pentagram of active spirit over the patent. Vibrate philema, kiss the ficus for the patent. For the wine, uncover the cup, sprinkle some water in. In the ruddy and awful cup of death, we shall drink the blood of the world and be drunken. This is from Libra 65, these lines. Make the ficus again, a pentagram of passive spirit, vibrate agape. I guess that, that's the consecration. I like this little ritual. I've done this before. Here's how it's done in uh, Lieber 15. This is a bit more complicated, but it starts, it starts out simply enough. There's a lot here. So the priest gestures toward the bread. He says, life of man upon earth. Fruit of labor, sustenance of endeavor, thus be thou nourishment of the spirit. Touches the host of the lance. By the virtue of the rod, be the spread the body of God. Raises it, he says, this is my body. Pretty simple. Similar thing with the wine. Vehicle of the joy of man upon earth, solace of labor, inspiration of endeavor, thus be thou ecstasy of the spirit. By the virtue of the rod, be this wine the blood of God. This is the cup of my blood. Starts out simple enough. Now, I want to point out something here. Remember before he said, take a substance symbolic of the whole course of nature, make it God, and consume it. And I was saying that the closer you get this to a universal substance, the closer you will get to this idea of a more universal spirit or the holy guardian angel. And you can see how he's trying to set this up here. So, for example, the bread sustains labor. You eat it, you get calories, it gives you energy to go do things. Labor also produces bread. It's a product of labor, so it creates this loop which he calls nourishment of the spirit. With the wine, you drink, and you get some wild hair up your ass to do something, and you go and you do it. <laughs> Labor, at the end of the day, you go back, you have a beer or a wine, and you relax. So it's a complete circle, which he calls ecstasy of the spirit. So you can see he's, he's trying to create something symbolic of, 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 because it's two elements, it's two courses, right? But he wants it to be a loop. Of this Eucharist, he says, this is a Eucharist of two elements. It has its matter of the passives. The wafer pentacle is of corn, typical of earth. The wine cup represents water. There are certain other attributions. The wafer is the sun, for instance, and the wine is appropriate to Bacchus. Now, this is, as it turns out, very important. You d don't allow yourself to get into a mindset where you think, oh, this is, like, this symbol is bread, therefore this is like male, or this is female or something, or this is or this is a dagger, this is, you know, this looks like a penis, so it's, it's a male instrument. Like, Crowley says in a few places that for a symbol to adequately represent something esoteric, it has to contain opposites within itself. It actually has to mean the opposites. There has to be at least some subtle way in which it suggests the opposite. So don't get lured into what I would consider, you know, what I te the technical term I call for is just being stupid. Where, <laughs> like, you look at things in just a one-sided way, and you're like, well, this represents guys, and this is the guy part of God. With, you know, just don't do that. 
the, the, the pinnacle, as you're going to see, is going to be drilled in. The, the, the pinnacle of philemonic spirituality, the ideal, is the unification of opposites. It's actually the me it's actually also the method of getting there. So it's not as though you know you need to get used to thinking that way at the beginning. The highest transcendent principle in philema is going to be a union of opposites. And you can think of that as male, female. You can think of it as a number of things. It doesn't really matter. But it always comes back to that. So just flag that. Be careful of that. So here's what we've done so far, just in this part that we've looked at. We have the bread on the one hand and the wine on the other. The bread has been magically linked to the body of the priest. The wine has been magically associated with the blood of the priest. Now, because the priest is the microcosmic deity, that also makes it the body and blood of God. Now, why is the priest the microcosmic deity? That's a longer story. We're not going to get into that. But just assume for now that he is. That's why, that's why when he consecrates it to himself, he can also say, I'm consecrating it to God. So you should see three things now. You should see the bread, the body of the priest, the body of God, the wine, the blood of the priest, the blood of the God, linked up. And ultimately, in the telegraph a little bit, what we're doing here is we're going to set up an act of sympathetic magic. That's really all this is going to turn out today. So if you know what sy sympathetic magic is, like he, he's going to treat these almost like little like little dolls. And it's like, and then he said this, and she said that, and it's, it's over. And it's supposed to have an effect on the people doing, doing the ritual. That's it's, it's not very far off from what's going to happen. So the consecration continues. This is a rather lengthy consecration. It's all of part six, which is called the consecration of the elements. Priest says, for this is the covenant of resurrection. Why, why is this the covenant of resurrection? Wait, what? <laughs> what does that mean? Then he makes five crosses on the priest. Now, I said before that the three crosses on, on the priest were important. The five crosses on her are important as well. It's because they add up to eight, and we'll see why that's important a little bit later. He says, Accept, O Lord, this sacrifice of life and joy, true warrants of the covenant of resurrection. Now, if you're paying attention before, he, he called the bread life of man upon earth, and he called the wine vehicle of the joy of man upon earth. So that's what he's talking about. He's going to sacrifice these to this Lord, which we don't know what that is yet. And it's going to be true warrants of the covenant of resurrection. Warrants here doesn't mean arrest warrant. It means just justification. So this is what's going to justify believing in this concept of resurrection, which we've got to look at a little more closely. Priest offers the lance to the priestess who kisses it. He then touches her, flings his arms up, says, let this offering, again the sacrifice, be borne upon the waves of Aether to our Lord and Father the Son that traveleth over the heavens in his name. So really all that's clear about this right now is that in some sense, these elements are going to be sacrificed. They're going to be sacrificed to this sun deity who for whatever reason is called on, and the outcome should have something to do with the resurrection. That's all we have so far. I'm, I'm laboring through this because remember what I said before. You look at the purpose, you look at the structure that's set up to achieve the purpose. It explains a whole lot. It makes it a lot easier. And if you're creating your own ritual, you can get into this mindset. Oh, you saw this diagram before. So here we have, we have life and joy together. We're going to treat them as one unit. There's some truth which is implicit in there. And by means of this process, which now we're calling sacrifice to on, we're going to get this other truth. We're going to get that truth out somehow, which is explicit. And because it's an act of sympathetic magic, it should do something to the operants. By the way, I should flag. When he makes the five, well, let me go back to that. Let's just, just notice that he makes five crosses on her right now. That becomes important later. And he has a name for this structure. It's called e -O. That's the structure. That's, that's, the, that's the formula of this. So this diagram you've been looking at the whole time, it has this structure. Which is also the name of a god. Because then the priest says he makes three crosses, strikes his breast. Here ye all saints of the true church of all time now essentially present, that if ye be claim heirship, with ye be claim communion, from ye be claim benediction in the name of ye. Uh, oh, who's this guy? This guy gets said six times in this ritual. The only God name that's 
said more than that is home the AUMG name. In my opinion, the name AUMGM describes the whole process of the mass. So if you're going to look at the mass as a whole, that's where that formula, I think, becomes more important. Um, but for the what we're about to do, I think it's this guy E O. So who's he? Oh wait, we're not ready for that yet. Then he elevates the coast in the cup. Oh, with the host, he makes five crosses on the cup. So remember he made five crosses on the priestess before? Now he's established magical link between the priestess and the cup. So the cup is associated both with him and the priestess now. Okay. It's all about the magical link. That way, whatever we do with these, we do with these people who are also doing it symbolically. Okay, that's what that's about. Uh, holds it up. Holy, holy, holy. Neo. So who's this guy, Neo? He says, this formula is the principal and most characteristic formula of Osiris, of the redemption of mankind. I is Isis, nature ruined by A, Apophis, destroyer, and restored to life by the redeemer Osiris. Okay, so now we're getting our, this is where our resurrection theme is coming in. The same idea is expressed by the Rosicrucian formula of the Trinity. We are born from God, we die in Jesus, we are reborn through the Holy Spirit. Now, he hastens to add that the doctrine of resurrection as vulgarly understood is false and absurd. He does not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, Crowley seems to be agnostic about what happens to you after you die. He certainly doesn't believe in a judgment day resurrection. The doc there, there is a doctrine of resurrection in Thelema, which we're going to look at. It's embodied in this ritual we're, we're examining, but it doesn't mean that. <laughs> and it's also not going to involve any kind of notion of sin. Um, the miserable mortal automaton remains in the circle. The magician who is destroyed by absorption in the Godhead is really destroyed. He's referring to something here called samadhi, which is union of subject and object. The miserable mortal automaton remains in the circle. It is of no more consequence to him than the dust of the floor. But before entering into the details of Iao as a magic formula, it should be remarked that it is essentially the formula of yoga or meditation. In fact, of elementary mysticism in all its branches. He means by that unification of subject and object where both appear, disappear in experience. So that's going to become important. So we're going to come back to EIO, but I wanted to just give you that. Um, now, who's this guy on? Let this offering be borne upon the waves of Aether to our Lord and Father, the Son, that traveleth over the heavens in his name on. Okay, let's just. This, as it turns out, is, is a somewhat complicated issue. So when you see words that are capitalized like this, these are usually names of gods, but also what Crowley calls magical formulae. And so a magical formulae will usually be the means by which you come to identification with that god. So it's a little map, a little treasure map to get, to get there. So on is referring to the sun. This is the sphere of the sun on the tree of life, to Ferith, which is a Hebrew word that means beauty. This is the path of Ayin, which is transliterated as O. This is the path of Noon, which is transliterated as N. So O and N are referring to these two lines that go in. The, enum the enumeration of this is 70. The enumeration of this is 50. They add up to 120. For reasons which I'm not going to go to, 120 is associated with resurrection. Okay. This is the third path, Samek. Samek spelled in full is 120. If you spell it incorrectly fully, it's 120, I should say. Um, so what he's saying is there's a process of sacrifice. Life and joy are going to be sacrificed. And it has something to do with these paths leading into Teferic. Now, what does this stand for on a spiritual level? On a spiritual level, if you're not concerned so much with a diagram, like what, is it, what does it actually mean? This is referred to a particular spiritual experience in Thelema, which is called knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. Knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, Crowley says, is a, you experience it as a unitive experience. You experience a, it's a state in which the oneness of all things becomes apparent, and it is accompanied by what he calls the beatific vision, which is the perception of the beauty of all things. In other traditions, it's called luminosity, or the divine illumination. 
what's happening is that when you're entering into here, the, it, some people talk about, well, is you know the holy guardian angel in here? That's not how Crowley thought about it. When you enter, when you receive initiation into Tefereth, and only you can initiate yourself into it, what's up here on the tree of life becomes apparent, and that's the sense of oneness that you're that you're perceiving. The way to achieve this, well, there are actually several ways to achieve this. This path here, Ayin, this is a more extroverted spiritual path. Not extroverted in the sense of being chatty or garrulous, but extroverted in the sense of going out into the senses. Okay, going wide with sensation. Um, if you read uh, the chapter on the devil card in Book of Thoth, he talks about this. This is the extroverted spiritual path. Noon is the path of withdrawal from sensation, symbolized by the death card. This is your more sort of classical meditative absorption in an ascetic path. You're withdrawing from sensuality. You're simply observing the sensations as they rise and fall. You're not grasping. Now, the paths point in opposite directions, but they will both lead to the one. They will both lead to a perception of the oneness of things. This is symbolic of the sun. You also know that if you do resh, you address the sun as unity uttermost showed. The sun is, the vis is supposed to be the visual representation of this unity. Now, this is not the highest initiation in Thalamic spirituality. What happens is that you enter into the divine luminosity, but then the question becomes, well, what's the source of the where, Where's that divine luminosity coming from? If you're outside on a cloudless day and it's really bright outside, you're, you, there's light all around. You don't perceive it directly, but you can see a lot of things. You know what the cause of it is. It's the sun in the sky, right? Likewise, if you experience this oneness of things, you know it's not coming from you because your sense of self has been not knocked offline for this. So where's it coming from? Why is it, why is it blasting out of everything? Why is it, where, where's that shining coming from? And that's what, you know, that's what brings you up to the top of this, or drives you on. But what I want to emphasize right now is that what you should hear in this is, let this offering be born, so we're sacrificing life and joy for entry into this experience of the divine luminosity. So in sacrifice, you might want to start hearing something like, sacrifice of my sense of separateness and individuality from the field of experience or from the flow of life. You can also hear in it sexual union, and that's also an important dimension of this. At the same time, we're going to see that the sexual union is important because of what it can, the other things that it can lead you to or what it symbolizes. Oh, the invocation. So this is probably... And this is probably the most important thing for all of magic in this, in this talk. Uh, the secret of success in invocation has not hitherto been disclosed. I don't know if that's true or not. It is an exceedingly simple one. It is practically of no importance whatever that the invocation should be right. There are a thousand different ways of compassing the end proposed so far as external things are concerned. The whole secret may be summarized in these four words. Inflame thyself in praying, the mind must be exalted until it loses consciousness of self. So there, there are various ways to achieve, to achieve a, um, you know, an appreciation of oneness. You can sit down and you can meditate until it comes and get really still and really quiet. That's not really the path of magic. The path, this, this path is getting yourself worked up into a kind of fervor. So really your success is going to be determined by the extent to which you are able to fulminate in prayer, basically. He offers a few different um, methods for doing it. He has the astral body, which he outlines in Libra O. Another method is to recite the name of the god as a mantra, or to recite a mantra suitable to the god. That's really great for personal workings. Um, that'll help you get into a trance state pretty quickly. Uh, the third method is the assumption of the form of the god, which he highly recommends. He says there are many other aids. The magician will be wise to busy himself in inventing new ones. So learn how to do this. This is really helpful for transforming your magical ritual. Um, he also adds, in the essay Energized Enthusiasm in number 9, volume 1 of the Equinox, 
is given a concise account of one of the classical methods of arousing Kundalini. This essay should be studied with care and determination. So this is a very, very interesting essay to read. Um, basically, what he talks, what he explores in this essay is the possibility of entering into mystical states through various forms of enthusiasms, uh, what he refers to as wine, women, and song. So intoxicants, sex, and um, you know, ecstatic singing and dancing. Um, the, I, I, th I think the primary, the primary motivation, the reason why you would want to explore those is that if the problem that we have a lot of time in accessing mystical states is that it requires contemplation. And it's hard to make the mind contemplate something continuously. The mind wants to think about something else. If there is an erotic dimension to the object of contemplation, then the mind will more naturally want to contemplate it. For example, think about if you've ever been in love. Do you have a hard time thinking about the person you're in love with? It's the other way. You have a hard time not thinking about the person that you're in love with. The mind naturally continues to move toward it. So if you could somehow get erotic love and spiritual love together, it would make that, that practice of contemplation more natural. You wouldn't need a technique to do it. That's the strength of doing this. In fact, one of the ways that you can start to work with this, and I mean this kind of dovetails with my interest for the last year, is to really just cultivate the sense, the appreciation for beauty. Allow yourself to get drawn into beauty. The mind naturally wants to contemplate beauty. That's very easy. Start noticing the beauty in all things. If you do magical ritual, use as many correspondences as you can from 777, colors, scents, all of it, music. Engage all of your senses. That's one of the strengths of the magical path. You could go out in the woods and just meditate, and that's a spiritual path. And if you're going to do magic, my feeling is, you know, go, go, whole hog, go all the way in. Allow yourself to get pulled into that sense of beauty and involved with it. Because remember, the mystical state represented by Tiferet involves the beatific vision. You can go at that from the, you know, from the, from the back door, so to speak, and you know, cultivate the beauty and get there the same way. So I think that's what, that, that's what I find interesting about, about this idea here. Moving along. Um, here's the invocation from Polyphilus' says short Eucharist. Unfortunately, it's a piece by, um, what's his name? JFC Fuller, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thou unity of all things, as the sun that ruleth through the twelve mansions of the skies, so art thou, O oh God, my God. I cannot slay thee, for thou art everywhere. Lo, though I lick up the boundless light, the boundless in the knot, there still shall I find thee. Thou unity of unities, thou oneness, O oh, thou perfect nothingness of bliss. It's fine, if you can get into it, then it works. <laughs> Here's the invocation from Mass of the Phoenix. Now I begin to pray, thou child, holy thy name and undefiled. Thy reign is come, thy will is done. Here is the bread, here is the blood. Bring me through midnight to the sun. Save me from evil and from good. That thy one crown of all the ten, even now, and here be mine. Amen. Mass of the Phoenix is a short Eucharistic ritual that Crowley wrote. Um, I'm not analyzing it, mostly because it's so compressed. It's very hard to see the structure in it. But an interesting thing for you to do would be after this class, go find Mass of the Phoenix and see if you could pick out all the different sections of it. It's like only, it's like fits on one page. Um, here's the invocation from Libra 15, section seven, the anthem. Thou who art I beyond all I am, who hast no nature and no name, who art when all but thou art gone, thou center and secret of the sun. So I mentioned before that when you enter into the experience of of beauty, the beatific vision, and the sense of oneness of all things, the next question that you would ask, the thing that pushes you on, is, well, what's the, what's the source of that? And the answer is that it's, it's coming from Kether. It's coming from the top of the tree of life. Um, another way that this is classically thought about is that the, the one is surrounded by a shell of beauty. So that's kind of, that's more of the metaphor that he's using here. That, it's, that you have a center and secret of the sun, which is surrounded by a visible one. 
and that you're drawn into that beauty and when you get in there and you then you get a sense of the deeper more profound concealed nature of God which is emanating this which is unifying itself and unifying all things at the same time so, thou hidden spring of all things known and unknown thou aloof alone so it's a transcendent principle thou the true fire within the reed brooding and breeding source and seed of life love liberty and light so it has these four qualities if you notice in the collects the lord visible and sensible source of light source of life and so now you're seeing that there's more of these qualities in there so this is what's responsible for that light that you see in the spiritual sun thou beyond speech and beyond sight thee i invoke my faint fresh fire kindling is mine intense aspire thee i invoke abiding one the center and secret of the sun so i should also point out that the center and secret of the sun this is going to become more obvious later is you can think of it as the holy guardian angel of each person so that's basically what's revealed that's the that's the sense of presence that you get when you get that initiation into Tikara. there's actually more to it than that in the context of this ritual which is interesting but that's one thing to think about in terms of Crowley's promises about it the Eucharistic magic leading to knowledge and conversation. So we'll come back to that. And that most holy mystery of which the vehicle am I. Remember he was saying that the um, when you go through initiation, you get a sense of your true self, and that matter is merely the, the vehicle of expression of this thing. Appear most awful and most mild as it is lawful in thy child. So there's going to be a child that comes out of this. We'll see that in a second, what that means. So, I mean, a nice thing... If you pay attention to the words, you can see the structure, and the structure tells you what's going on. And if you have the structure, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to know what you're doing. And if you know what you're, if you know what you're doing, either as a congregant or as a or as clergy, it's, it's a good thing. Now we get into the consummation. So the section eight is titled "Of the Mystic Marriage and Consummation of the Eucharist." So this is a very strange title. Um, which I used to just kind of stare at, and not really it took me a long time to even comprehend what the hell this meant. Because it's the mystic marriage and consummation of the elements. And in my mind, I was always like, oh, you know, it's the priest and the priest getting it on up there. You know, that's what it's about. And that's explicitly not what he says. <laughs> he says it's the mystic marriage and consummation of the elements. So remember, it's sympathetic magic. It's like, like hey, priest, how are you? Oh, my goodness. And so it's like you're doing this weird little thing with like, with almost like with Do like Dawson, and then eating them. It's so strange. <laughs> I wish I could play like this as a kid. This is so <laughs> Let's flag mystic marriage for a second, or bracket that in, and think about consummation. This is very this is ambiguity here because you consume it, and he's also calling it a consummation. Consume means to eat or drink, but it also means to destroy. So remember that sacrificial process that we were talking about. Consummate means to make complete by having sexual intercourse, also to make perfect. So remember that little diagram, which we're going to see again, where you start with the first matter, and you get, you get something perfect out of it. So that's what you should read in that. Now, what about the mystic marriage? He says, this is from, um, this is from the chapter on the circle in Book 4, Part 2. He says, the Tao and the circle together make one form of the rosy cross, the uniting of subject and object, which is the great work. Okay, so keep that in mind. <laughs> that's the goal, is uniting of subject and object. And which is symbolized sometimes as this cross and circle, sometimes as the lingam yoni, sometimes as the anchor crooks and sada, sometimes by the spire and eve of a church or temple, and sometimes as a mis as a marriage feast, mystic marriage, spiritual marriage, chemical nuptials, and in a hundred other ways. Whatever the form chosen, it is a symbol of the great work. So don't get don't get too distracted about thinking of like oh, this is sublimated sex magic or something like that. Because whether you're doing it with bread and wine or whether you're doing it with sex or whether you're doing it with meditation or whether you're doing it by dancing yourself into a frenzy, it's all about this for Crowley. It's all ways of doing that. And in a hundred other ways, right? <laughs> He's indifferent to it. So in mystic marriage and consummation of the elements, you should hear these three things. Consummation of the great work, uniting of subject and object, or initiation into teferit or on, however you want to symbolize that, but accomplished as a work of sympathetic magic. You should hear a process which perfects the first matter, in this case, the elements of the Eucharist, and you should hear the A phase of this eon of structure. 
So we gotta go back to Eyal and clear this up a bit. The Master Therion. In the 17th year, the Aeon has reconstructed the word Eyal to satisfy the new conditions of magic imposed by progress. The word of the law being Thalema, whose number is 93, this number should be the canon of a corresponding mass. Gosh, I wonder what mass that could be. Accordingly, he has expanded Iao by treating the O as an Ayin and then adding Vau as prefix and apex. So the full word is Vau, Yod, Aleph, Ayin, Vau, or Viau, whose number is 93. We may analyze this new word in detail and demonstrate that it is a proper hieroglyph of the ritual of self initiation in this Aeon, of course. Ritual of self initiation just means bringing yourself to subject object and unity. That's all that means. It means doing it yourself. Aeon of Horus. Two sexes in one person. Two sexes in one person! What? <laughs> 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 I, just, I emphasize that enough. <laughs> VIO 93, the full formula, recognizing the sun as the sun or star as the pre existent manifested unit from which all springs into which all returns. V is the manifested star. In this context of the ritual, we know that the priest has already been identified with the sun. Be the flame of the sun, thy ambiance, so thou priest of the sun. So that's, that's been made pretty clear. We're in a big, red and gold room. Now what about the eye? In this case, the eye is going to be his secret seed. It's the secret life, light, love, liberty, and silence. It is also the virgin. His essence is inviolate. So this will be a little clearer with this diagram here. Here's what we've got. So you got the priest and his body as the first matter. There's something concealed within him, that essence that we want to isolate, the, the virgin essence. Sacrifice to on, which we now know is unification of subject and object, is going to cause it to pop out. <laughs> But what is it, and what does it have to do with this? <coughs> okay. The first process is to find the I and the V, initiation, purification, finding the secret root of oneself, the Epicene Virgin. So that's basically what's going to be accomplished by breaking this thing open. <laughs> he uncovers the cup, Jenny Flex rises, takes the host, breaks it, breaks off a particle. This is my seed. The Father is the Son through the Holy Spirit. Blah, blah, blah. Okay? So he's trying to isolate that little circular portion inside of him, the eye. This yod in the virgin expands to the babe in the egg by formulating the secret wisdom of truth of Hermes and the silence of the fool. All right, calm down, calm down. It's going to be all right. It's getting crazy with us. The babe in the egg is just Harpocrates. <laughs> This is from the Book of Thoth. Now consider the traditional form of Harpocrates. He is a babe, that is to say, innocent, and not yet arrived at puberty, a simpler form of Parsifal. He is represented as rose pink in color. This babe is in an egg of blue, which is evidently the symbol of the mother. This child has, in a way, not been born. The blue is the blue of space. The egg is sitting upon a lotus, and this lotus grows on the Nile. Now the lotus is another symbol of the mother, and the Nile is also a symbol of the father, fertilizing Egypt and Yoni. Okay. Don't get carried away whenever he talks that way. He's always just talking again about subject-object unity in one form or another. Okay? So basically what he's saying is that when subject and object come together, he's representing it with this god, Harpocrates, or babe in the egg of blue. Um, in his comment on Libra Elvel Legis, chapter 2, verse 8, uh, the verse is, Who worshipped Haru Pakroth? have worshipped me ill, for I am the worshipper. This is just the Egyptian spelling of Harpocrates. He says, Harpocrates is also the dwarf soul, the secret self of every man, the serpent with the lion's head. We're going to come back to him in a second. So again, just reiterating this connection between this, this iota, the secret seed that he's holding up, Harpocrates and the secret self of a person. But he goes on to say... But the small person of Hindu mysticism, the dwarf, insane, yet crafty of many legends and many lands, is also the same holy ghost, or silent self of a man, or his holy guardian angel. So you can see how it's being chained together, all these different ways of expressing this kind of the same spiritual realization, one word for which is holy guardian angel. I was as the minister of Horparkrat. That's going to be important in a second. 
Uh, this is the rest of the anthem. For of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is the norm. Male, female, quintessential, one. Man being veiled in woman form. Glory and worship in the highest, thou dove mankind that deifies. Being that race most royally run to spring sunshine through winter storm. Glory and worship be to thee, sap of the world, ash, wonder, trait. So here we have the Holy Spirit represented as a dove, and it's descending into something that looks curiously like a, like a cup, like a grill. And again, we have the unification of male and female, and we have that which deifies the individual, which is an interesting idea, because deification is going to have something to do with resurrection. And so then the question is, like, well, what does that really mean? Like, what does it mean to deify in a Thelemic context? What does it mean that every man and every woman is, is God? What, is, what does that come out to? Now, there's another meaning to hear in Horpar Krop. Iwaz is called the minister of Horpar Krop, the god of silence, for his word is the speech of the silence. Now, without, without interpreting the book of the law for you, just notice that Harpocrates is also being declared as a spiritual essence which is at once the source behind the book of the law and aloof from it. That's basically what Crowley's saying here. So in Harpocrates, you can think holy guardian angel on a personal level, but in a broader, more spiritual sense, you can think of the spiritual inspiration behind the Book of the Law. Because he's saying that the Book of the Book of the Law is spoken by Iwas. Iwas is the representative of the God of Silence. So that's important for thinking about this as a religious rite, as opposed to just a personal magic. Um, it's a long quote, but this is actually really good and helps really kind of tie everything together. Iwas is the name given by Ward of the Seer, that's Rose Kelly, his wife, as that of the intelligence communicating the Book of the Law. For Parkrat, or Hippocrates, the babe in the egg of blue is not merely the god of silence in a conventional sense. He represents the higher self, the holy guardian angel. He contains everything in himself that is unmanifested. He is the first letter of the alphabet, Aleph, whose number is one. And his card in this row is the full number zero. Now as one or Allah, he represents the male principle, the first cause, and the free breath of life. As zero, he represents the female principle, the fertile mother. Okay. So remember when I said that you, you enter into knowledge and conversation, you enter into this beatific vision, the sense of oneness that Curly talks about. You wonder after the source of the one. This is the one. It's also zero. And it's a mix of male and female, or a uniting of all opposites. This is the central sort of spiritual. At, at this point, you're kind of circling around sort of like the central core of Thelemic mysticism and theology at this point, which is interesting because we just started out by talking about bread and wine, and this is where we got. Long quote. Um, In his absolute innocence and ignorance, he is the fool, he is the savior. We're going to come back to what that means. But to be savior, he must be born and grow to manhood. Thus, Parsifal acquires the sacred lance, emblem of virility. He is now also the green man of spring festivals, that's Pan. But his folly is now not innocence, but inspiration of wine. He drinks from the grail offered to him by the priestess. It's a little bit on the nose. Almost identical symbols are those of the secret god of the Templars, the bisexual Baphomet, which is exactly where we're going next in the ritual. He's shown in his full form in Tarot Trump 15. The title of the ritual is Number 15, Gnostic Mass. So here's what happens. The priest extends the lance point. The priest clasps the cup in his left hand. Together they depress the lance point in the cup. It's got the particle on it. Curl you. Curl you is the shrill cry of orgasm from the, um, a vision and voice. The priest takes the lance. The priest covers the cup. O lion and O serpent that destroyed the destroyer, be mighty among us. We know from the creed that the lion and the serpent is Baphomet, who we just saw. Okay. Basically, I gets turned into A, A grows into O, is the idea. This yod in the virgin expands to the babe in the egg by formulating the secret wisdom of truth of Hermes and the silence of the fool. He acquires the eye wand, beholding the acting and being adored. The inverted pentagram, Baphomet, the hermaphrodite, fully grown, but gets himself on himself as a V again. That's what it all looks like together. Okay. So you got your vow, the priest isolates the eye, sacrifice to own at the hurl you moment. Why is this sacrifice to own? 
The cup is the cup of Babylon. Babylon means eat of the god only. Which is just, it's, it's, it's this. It's basically unification of subject and object, depicted in this case in a quasi-erotic way. And it produces O, or Ayin, which is Baphomet. Now, what's the best way to understand Baphomet? Well, I think there's a lot of ways you can understand this. We'll look at a couple of them. The way that I think, prefer to think about Baphomet, just in terms of an act of magic, is that what you're trying to do here is, is bring out this highest spiritual principle of Thelema, the, the one or the none, as Crowley calls it, this unification of opposites, and manifest it on the material level in a talisman. Can you take the very highest and manifest it on the very lowest, is what it comes down to. If you can, good, because that's basically what the great work means, <laughs> right? <laughs> Greeting of earth and heaven, as the priestess says at the beginning of it. Um, so what's this business about savior? Because that ties in with the whole resurrection thing. This is from the wake world. This is um, Lola reporting. She says, but in the first we came to a mighty throne of gray granite, shaped like the sweetest pussycat you ever saw, and set upon a desolate heath. It was midnight, and the devil came down and sat in the midst. But my fairy prince whispered, hush, it is a great secret, but his name is Yahushua, and he is the savior of the world. And that was very funny, because the girl next to me thought it was Jesus Christ. So another fairy prince, my prince's brother, whispered as he kissed her, hush, tell nobody ever. That is Satan, and he is the savior of the world. So this name, Yeheshua, in the Golden Dawn, if they spelled it um, Yod, He, Sheen, Vau, He. And the idea was that, was that spirit, represented by the letter Sheen, descends down into the midst of the four elements, which are dead and kind of stupid and dumb, and revivifies, and, re and that's what resurrection is. It's this descent of spirit into matter. In Thelema, it's similar, but it, it's again, it's actually more like an alchemical transmutation. You have the divine within you already. It's a question of bringing it out. And that's essentially what counts as resurrection in a Thelemic context. It's basically the first ordeal you go through in AA, is to get in touch with that virgin essence of yourself and to illuminate all of the matter around you. That's what counts as resurrection in that system. And so, on the one hand, he, you know, it's symbolized as Yeheshua, but then also as, as Satan. Satan is the, material, is the more materialistic aspect of it. Um, EIO 131 kind of ties a lot of these themes together nicely in his book. He says, therefore, Baphomet is seen as the Redeemer, Christ, Logos, or Word of the New Aeon. Of course, we do not believe that Baphomet died for our sins, but rather Baphomet is an image of our own perfected self, the glyph of arcane perfection, the complete magician who has united male and female, earth and heaven, into a single flawless pyramid, and united subject and object. Right? Now we understand why Crofi said this. We go full circle. To a magician thus renewed by Eucharistic magic, the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel becomes an inevitable task. Every force of his nature, unhindered, tends to that aim and goal of whose nature neither man nor God may speak, for that it is infinitely beyond speech or thought or ecstasy or silence. So now you can see why. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a complicated argument, but if you step back and look at it, basically, it's all about finding within you that pure essence, isolating it and elevating it and purifying it somehow through a process of dissolution of your sense of separateness with what's around you. And in the case of the Eucharist, you're just doing it with this bread and wine and kind of acting it out as sympathetic magic. Um, this is a diagram that I made of the same thing. This is based on um, Sabazius's essay, A Curious Investigation Concerning the Nature of the Mass. Basically, this is the wine, this is the bread, that's the particle, and that's the eight-part Baphomet Eucharist. I'm not going to explain it. If you want to look, you can read his essay and then look at this side by side. With it. You'll see right here. Just another way of representing it. Um, the priest takes back his lance, lowers and raises it. Do it thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. So, remember what I said that, <clears throat> you know, 
you can look at this, you can look at Harpocrates one of two ways. Well, I mean, it's, they, they overlap. In one sense, it, it's, a, it's a representation of the holy guardian angel of a person. Now, is the priest up there serving his holy guardian angel to the congregants? Like, that doesn't really, that wouldn't be very inspiring. I don't think I'd go to that mass. <laughs> but um, the other meaning of it is that, in a certain sense, you are embodying this highest spiritual principle of Philema itself, which motivated the Book of the Law, and which, you know, in the context of your own universe, would be your holy guardian angel. But in terms of a congregation, would be something more like the logos of Philema itself, the word Philema. And bringing that into a talisman and giving that to people to help bring Philema into their lives. Um, so this is interesting. These are the colors associated with um, the path of Sheen, which is spirit, manifested in Asaya, which is the material level. And so, and it's these colors arranged in a circle: black, blue, yellow, red, and white. Which you can line up with black child, priestess, deacon priest and white child. It's the colors that you see in the Mass. So you might profitably think about the Gnostic Mass as a ritual which embodies spirit, the highest sense of spirit, in the material realm. Connecting the highest with the lowest. Just a neat thing. Actually, you pointed that out to me. Thumbs up. Then the priest eats it. In my mouth be the essence of the life of the sun. In my mouth be the essence of the joy of the earth. You can think about this. I haven't touched on tetragrammaton much, and I'm not going to now. Um, but the life of the sun, you can think of as Val, or Tefereth, and the joy of the earth, you can think of as Malkuth, or Hephael. You bring them together in the chemical nuptials, or the mystic marriage, and you consume them. So essentially, the power of that union between them enters into you and becomes part of you. Another way of looking at it is that Yod would be the priest, He would be the priestess. Uh, the bread is consecrated to him, the wine to both. By bringing them together, you are, in effect, bringing the two of them together indirectly. And then he turns and says, There is no part of me that is not of the gods. And the congregants do the same thing in an attitude of resurrection. Now we have kind of a better idea of what resurrection means. That light inside of you will illuminate from within and set you on that path toward resurrection. Um, one of the interesting ideas in this is that, I don't know, I don't know that. Crowley kind of does talk about this in the Book of Lies, which he wrote at the same time as this ritual, the idea of the aspiration of the divine to unite with the finite. So it's not just us trying to go up, the gods also get something about out of coming down and embodying in us and enjoying and, and enjoying carnality. So in a certain sense, by eating the gods, they are coming into us and inhabiting us, and we're giving them the opportunity to be here on Earth as well. It's a really interesting idea. I wrote, um, I wrote an article on it, which is on my, my website, which you might want to check out. It's another, it's another way of thinking about this ritual, that there's actually two things happening, not just one. It's not just about us getting something for ourselves. It's also about like the divine getting something for it as well. So some practical takeaways. Here's some general magical pointers. So the most important factor, we looked at this you know, like an hour or two ago now. Concentration, it's good for meditation. It's good for personal ritual. It's good for public rites. <coughs> you know that it's composed of these factors, ardency, mindfulness, and attentiveness, of which mindfulness is the most important. That's just keeping in mind what it is that you're supposed to be doing, what that purpose is. The singularity of purpose we saw again and again. Its ethical culmination is true will, so that sense of internal alignment. And its contemplative culmination is samadhi, which is really the sort of spiritual attainment that Crowley is so excited about. Here's some pointers for Eucharistic magic. Think of it as alchemical transmutation. Think about that when you're selecting what elements you want to use for it. Think about it as mirroring the cosmological process that it's not just about you getting something, but about you attuning yourself to something much larger. Think about it as being isomorphic with initiation, as having the same agenda as initiation, of it being a kind of sympathetic magic. And think about the structure. If nothing else, start to think about the structure of, of your rituals and, and you know. How the, how the different elements or different aspects are incorporated into that structure to serve that, that one point. Here are a few insights into Libra 15. It's a Eucharist of two elements. 
We saw that it was consecrated into an initiatory structure of Iago, that it's meant to embody the highest and most transcendent principle of Hellenic spirituality, which we could think of on the personal level as HTA, or we can think of as the divine presence behind Libra L or motivating this entire thing, the God of Silence. Apparently that's all I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your attention and indulgence. Love is a little love under will. Thank you. Um, I can answer questions if you have any. Or if you don't have questions, comments. Hate mail. You don't have to mail it to say the same. Okay, well, thank you. I'm sorry, guys. No, no. What is isomorphic? What is that? Oh, sorry. Sharing the same shape or the same structure. Yeah, I said that. Um, well, Curly says that alchemy. Initiation, Eucharistic magic, talismanic magic, and art production all share the same structure, which is about taking something dead and making it alive. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. One easy way of doing Eucharistic magic daily, I think, is just doing will. Yes, <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yeah. um, and like, probably fire, however you pronounce it. Um, was his his version of like, this is not only do it for myself it's like a singular but then we could do it as a community and mm -hmm. it kind of knocks it up a bit and I've heard um, Sister Kathy describe doing well on food as doing like she imagines the mass happening like in the midst of that like every time wow it's like <laughs> uh, there you go cool yeah, no, that's actually a really, I mean, it's, and, you know, the common factor, I think, is that you're, you're doing something with purpose. You're linking it up with the highest purpose. Yeah, doing well is totally Eucharistic matter. Good point. This is going to sound very simplistic, I'm sure, but you, you never actually said this, this statement or words, but I'm assuming that you're, you're speaking about divine union in this. Okay. I never actually heard you say that, and I wanted to make sure that what I, what my mind was going through this whole process was what you were trying. I kept to. saying um, union of subject and object. Okay, I think is what that's your word. And that's not that's not the same thing. Okay. So yeah, that's important. So object is everything that you see around you. Subject is your sense of separateness from yes. it. That there is an observer yes. or a doer. Yeah. The idea is that if you get past that sense of an observer or a doer something else starts to shine through. It's the unity that starts to shine through. And you realize that you're not the one doing it, mm -hmm. that you're just another thing that's sort of in this field of experience. Mm -hmm. And so then that suggests something that is somehow manifesting itself here through the unity of things, but it's not present. And that's the divinity. Okay. So, yeah, it's ambiguous. Because you can have a mystical experience mm -hmm. and you unite with something, but it's not clear that you united with the divine necessarily. Yeah. Different people interpret that experience very differently. Okay. You can interpret it in atheistic ways that I know people who do. Um, yeah, that's a good point. When it comes to embodying like Harpocrates or what is what he calls it, the higher self, mm -hmm. that's about embodying the divine in a material talisman. Okay. That's what that's about. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's a good point. I mean that's a sub that's a very subtle there's a very subtle distinction. 